Hello everyone. Um, so I've done a few things on YouTube now, sort of um, political commentary, uh, reading poetry, and um, now I thought I would do a book review. And uh, sort of a book review. The book I want to look at is this one here, The Shape of Ancient Thought by uh, Thomas McEvely. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right. And as you'll see here, <laughs> sort of, it also has the subtitle Comparative Studies in Greek and Indian Philosophy. And McEvely, I think, was actually mainly an art historian. He was employed as an art historian at Rice University for many years. I think he died a few years ago. But uh, he had a PhD in uh, classical philology uh, from Cincinnati, and he clearly knows his stuff uh, about uh, the Greco-Roman world. So uh, this is a super interesting book. I highly recommend it. It's quite quite chunky, quite a lot in it, and uh, it basically tries to do two things. Uh, one is to extensively document parallels between Greek and Indian philosophy of various periods, uh, something that it does quite well, I think. Although, you know, you may be more or less convinced by particular parallels that he tries to draw. And uh, the other thing is that he argues that Greek philosophy, or at least a big strain in Greek philosophy, owes a lot to ancient Indian thought. And, of course, once you argue that, you have to try and give an account of how these connections or how these transmissions of ideas actually took place. And so he discusses that at various points. Um, he suggests that, at least in the early centuries, the transmission goes via Persia. I mean, it kind of has to. Um, and then, of course, after Alexander the Great basically conquers uh, the whole of Persia, and you have the Seleucid Greeks, and you have the Greco-Bactrian kingdoms, then it's a bit more obvious where you can get this cultural intermingling. It's, it's documented that there's cultural intermingling at that point between Greeks and uh, Indians, especially Buddhist Indians. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit more obvious. So many of his chapters just take the form of side-by-side -side presentation of Greek and Indian schools of thought. So we have chapters with titles like this, Plato and Kundalini, uh, Peripatetics and Vaisasikas, Plotinus and Vijnanavada Buddhism. And actually, if you know a bit about Greek philosophy, if you've ever studied Greek philosophy, you know, enough to recognize the, the first of those names that I've read out, you know, Plato, the Peripatetics, who are Aristotelians, uh, who Plotinus is, then this is actually a really good book I found to learn a bit more about Indian philosophy through, because it always gives you that anchor, you know, you can think, oh yeah, that was the figure who, McEvely at least, uh, compared to uh, Plotinus or compared to Aristotle or some aspect of Aristotle. So uh, I found that quite uh, helpful. Um, so I can't go through any of this material really in any depth. I mean, I'd recommend the book, but it's quite a, as I say, it's quite a chunky one, so I can't go through it um, argument by argument. But I'll tell you one thing I liked about the book. I'll tell you uh, one reservation I had. And then the rest of this video, I really just want to turn my attention to one particular topic that I found particularly interesting. So uh, one thing I liked about this book was the way it draws attention to the more mystical strains of Greek philosophy. Something which, I mean, I don't think is completely new. It, it's been sort of hiding in plain sight. Um, you know, McEvely isn't the per first person ever to stress, uh, you know, the irrational, as you might call it, side of Greek uh, culture. Uh, but he draws it out in an interesting way, and the way that he does it really is by placing it into uh, the tradition of Indian mysticism, uh, basically. So, uh, for example, McEvely goes quite deeply into sources about early Indian traveling mystics. Uh, so, for example, in certain traditions they were meant to be imperturbable, they were meant to be able to endure extremes of uh, heat and cold, they are meant to be able to drink without getting drunk, they are meant to have a great ability to resist sexual allurement. Um, and he points out, very interestingly, that these are all things that you can see in the Platonic reports about Socrates. So in the symposium, for example, Socrates uh, is said to have stood all day in the snow 
thinking about a philosophical problem, essentially. And he said, you know, he's described as being at this party all night. He's still going at the end. He's still doing uh, philosophy with a, with a perfectly unclouded mind. And, of course, he's also described as having rebuffed the attentions of Alcibiades, who apparently everybody in Athens at the time um, had a crush on, fancied. So um, it's an interesting way of looking at it, because, of course, we're used to seeing Socrates as one of the inaugurators of uh, a very rational strain in Western philosophy. And he is that, too. I mean, I don't think McEvely would deny that that element exists in the Platonic Dialogues, that Socrates is trying to catch people out in contradictions, um, trying to pin them down in terms of definitions, to have a consistent definition that runs like a thread through different cases of things. So he's obviously doing a lot of what we would call rationalism, we might call rationalism, um, but you, you can look at the figure of Socrates from this different angle as well. I found that uh, quite interesting and um, convincing, actually. And I think uh, McEvely does this a few times, and sometimes I was a bit less convinced, but that's okay. Um, he makes he tries to make a similar move about Diogenes the Cynic. Diogenes the Cynic, uh, who was born a few years before Socrates died, so around the turn of the 4th century BC. And uh, the Western tradition uh, associates Diogenes with a tub, Right, there are all these later paintings of Diogenes living in a tub, and it's always I always thought when I learned about Diogenes the Cynic, what what is a tub? Why does he have a tub? Is it a bathtub or something? Uh, did they have bathtubs in the ancient world? Um, but uh, McEvely points out that the Greek sources actually talk about a pithos, and a pithos is a is a big ceramic pot or a jar. Uh, it's the kind of thing the ancients would store food in. Uh, actually, have you ever been on a ancient Greek archaeological site? Uh, as I have, you occasionally will dig up pithos jars, and they have these quite big rims, and you're meant to sort of dig very carefully within, because there's probably something that you can analyze within it, right, food. So they're relatively large jars. Um, but the, so the sources about Diogenes the Cynic, they don't say that he lived in it long term. It, was, it wasn't like his permanent address, or, you know, he wasn't always inside of it. Um, but he had it around, so what, what's going on? So McEvely uh, finds evidence that some Indian ascetics probably Ajivikas, uh, would occasionally enter large pots as an ascetic practice. So uh, there's a Jain sutra that he quotes that says, for example, the monk is held to have made the highest penance when he entered large earthen pots. <laughs> so yeah, so McEvely asks us to imagine that Diogenes is actually doing this as a kind of ascetic practice. He's entering a pot for maybe a period of, I don't know, days or something in order to show that he's, he's mastered himself. So I don't know, I don't know how, how much I buy this, but again, it's a very interesting suggestion. And it puts, uh, uh, you know, what we're used to thinking of as a Western philosopher into the Indian, not only intellectual, but the Indian spiritual and mystical tradition in, a, in an interesting and, and kind of unexpected way. So um, I said I had some reservations about the book. I mean, I think um, there's a lot in there, so you know, no one's gonna agree with absolutely everything. Not everyone's going to be convinced by all the parallels uh, that he draws. Um, and my only reservation, I guess, is that if you immerse yourself in these two traditions of Greek and Indian philosophy as much as McEvely does, um, then it's easy to see the similarities. And he does make a strong case for a lot of the similarities. But still, it's sometimes healthy to remember the differences, too. There are also differences that emerge, and maybe he doesn't stress them quite as much as he might. I mean, his project here is to stress the similarity, so I kind of understand, but I think there, there are various places at which um, differences pop out, and, and, and he might have followed them up in a way which could actually be revealing as well. Um, for example, uh, though as we'll soon see, both Indian and Greek philosophy both had a tradition of what we might call negative dialectic, where thought is destroyed. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Greek tradition sometimes took dialectic in a more pragmatically constructive way, in a less spiritual direction. I think that's a fair claim. Um, it, it, the Western tradition seems to go more in the direction of Aristotle's syllogism of building claims and other claims in a way which has a certain validity. Um, I think that, 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 that the Indian tradition is slightly more interested in this kind of negative dialectic. That's my impression. Um, McEvely himself actually admits something of this when he, he notes that the logic and the metaphysics of the Vaisasika school 
um, though it has a lot of parallels in Aristotelian logic and metaphysics, it still retains a more doctrinal sort of substrate. It's still interested in uh, resurrection, things like that, reincarnation, I should say. Um, and now, obviously, that doctrine has versions in the Western, in, in the Greek tradition as well, right? And Pythagoreanism and, and, and things like that. But um, uh, these are differences of emphasis, and I think there are differences of emphasis in the way that these traditions uh, develop at different points of time. But anyway, so that's a huge topic, you know, how different these traditions are, the ways that they develop differently. I mean, that's basically kind of like uh, an intellectual history of the, of the world. And I'm not going to do this in a YouTube video. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I should someday. Nothing against YouTube videos, but I mean, it's a lot. So um, this is just a review, right? So in the rest of this, um, I, I actually just want to go into something I found interesting, no, um, not so much as a scholar, um, but as someone who has some interest in spiritual practices myself, and I mean, I can't really take it on as a scholar because, you know, my specialty is ancient Greek democracy. Um, I'm not even a philosopher, I'm not even an ancient philosopher, but um, I, I, have an, I have an interest in, in meditation and, and Buddhism. So uh, there's some things which McEvely wrote, uh, which actually explained a lot to me in terms of the parts of the Buddhist tradition that you will run into even in the West, if you go to meditation groups and things, are certainly the more kind of religious ones. Um, and this is also, by the way, uh, a good reason to study uh, past intellectual traditions, because you'd be surprised how much you're studying ancient Greek philosophy or whatever it is, Indian philosophy, and you think, ah, that's where this came from, right? You sort of take all these concepts as natural, but actually they have this deep history. Um, so what I want to focus in on just at the end here is um, this may actually be like half the video, but what I want to focus in on is McEvely's two or three chapters on the Majamika school and, and dialectic, this idea of negative dialectic. And I found these chapters particularly interesting. Okay, so the Majamika school, I just sort of threw that out there. What, what is that? Well, it's a, it's a really influential school within Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana being, as you probably know, that the huge sway of Buddhism that grows out of India, but then grows up in China and Japan, right, as opposed to the Theravada tradition, which is more common in, in Southeast Asia. Um, Majamika is associated mainly, or, 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 you know, to a large extent, with the figure of Nagarjuna, uh, who is around probably in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, to use the, the Western term, 2nd and 3rd century CE, whatever you prefer. Um, if you've ever been to Western Buddhist groups, you'll definitely have met the Majamika's influence uh, through its stress on things like emptiness, which is especially big in Zen. And one of the other big uh, interests in Majamika, as McEvely shows, uh, is a kind of dialectic, uh, and which I've called negative dialectic before in this video because it actually proceeds to undermine every argument or claim you might make about the world, right? That's why it's negative. It's not like I can build claim upon claim, like in the Aristotelian syllogism. It's, um, here's a claim, I can show that that's wrong. Okay, well then what's the opposite of that claim? Is that right? No, I will then destroy that claim as well. So you have no, no way, no, nowhere to turn, right? A and so everything is wrong, and then this dialectic, this negative dialectic will encourage you to conclude not only that everything is wrong, but also everything is not wrong. <laughs> uh, which doesn't make much sense to us. In, in fact, it breaks one of the laws of thought that Bertrand Russell talks about in the Western tradition, the law of non-contradiction. I mean, it's, in, it's everywhere in the world. People <laughs> naturally have the, the, the idea that contradicting yourself is somehow wrong on a logical level. Uh, but some religious traditions kind of go there in an interesting way, in a very emphatic way. And so and Majamika is one of them. So you can hear this tendency, for example, in the Heart Sutra. And, and the Heart Sutra is probably the most recited Sutra in, in the Mahayana tradition, and certainly if you've ever been to a Western Zen center, you'll you'll run into this probably very early in the morning, actually. But I'll just read out a bit of it. The Buddha it imagines the Buddha addressing Shariputra, another a figure, and and he says, "Oh Shariputra, all dharmas are forms of emptiness. All, all teachings are forms of emptiness, not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without loss, without gain. So in emptiness, there is no form." No sensation, no conception, discrimination, awareness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, no sound, smell, taste, touch, phenomena, 
no realm of sight, no realm of consciousness, no ignorance, and no end to ignorance, <laughs> no, old, no, no old age and death, and no end to old age and death, no suffering, no cause of suffering, no extinguishing, no path, no wisdom, and no gain. Yeah, so that's right. So it's not only that there's, there's, there's no ignorance, but there's also no end to ignorance. And so, sometimes it's go, the, the, these texts go even further. It's not just that there's no cessation of ignorance. It's just that there's no, there's no ignorance and there's also no not ignorance, <laughs> right? which isn't what you meant, you know, the normal way of looking at logic is that that's one of the main assumptions. You're not meant to be able to do that. You're not meant to say not X and X, which is the same as not not X. Um, but anyway, they, they, as I say, these, these texts like to do that a lot. They go out of their way to do that. Um, and McEvely finds similar expressions in Greek text, so it's not just a Majamika thing. Um, and actually, it does remind me, uh, for example, of uh, an earlier part of the Greek tradition. For example, Heraclitus, who I also think is, is part of this mystical line in Greek thought, and I think McEvely does too. So Heraclitus is famous for saying, um, <clears throat> You know, you can't step into the same river twice, or a version of that claim. Uh, but one of the fragments we have of him actually con concludes, or it says, you are and you are not looking at the same river, okay? <laughs> and then, we are and we are not. And I think in the Greek, there's actually tekai, you know, it's a very emphatic form of and. So it's, there's no getting out of it. We, we exist, X, and also, we don't exist. Not X. Okay, so Heraclitus. So you know you can look at you can look at the tradition of early Greek philosophy. Certain bits of it is very rationalistic, proto-scientific, right? The Ionians, uh, the Milesians are meant to be like this. Heraclitus, uh, not so much. If he's saying things like this, um, McEvely is actually interested in, in slightly later part of the Greek tradition, um, the skeptics. So he finds a, a probably skeptical commentator on Plato's Phaedo, who says. The following, no form, no words, no object of taste or smell, or touch, or any other object of perception has any distinctive character. Okay, so a slightly different point there at the end, but um, it's strikingly similar, I think you'll agree, to some of the language that's used in the Heart Sutra. You know, I don't want to jump to conclusions about exactly why that's the case, but it's very interesting. Um, and McEvely thinks this Majamika tendency to want to negate everything is really all over skepticism. And skepticism is a Greek tradition. Skepticism grows out of uh, the thought of Pyrrho of Elis. Pyrrho of Elis is the great early figure in skepticism. Um, he's born a few decades after Diogenes the Cynic, so that kind of period. And uh, McEvely has a whole section where he just plunks down bits of Mahayana Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism, uh, and uh, classical writers, and Greek skeptics side by side. So, for example, there's a skeptical writer, Sextus Empiricus, uh, and Sextus Empiricus says, for example, nothing is more this than that, right? And then McEvely finds Talopa, Indian Buddhist writer, saying, in the final wisdom, there is neither this nor that. And I see it's not quite the same because uh, Sextus Empiricus has nothing is more, nothing is more this than that. There's a comparative element. Uh, Talopa doesn't have that. But again, the language is very, very similar. And it... it it's one of those things, you know, as I said earlier, maybe you just find these things if you look hard enough for them. There's so many texts out there, eventually you find, you find these patterns. But uh, some, of the some of the individual sort of lexical similarities seem, seem very striking. Uh, so I, I'm kind of persuaded by a lot of what Kevin says, to be perfectly honest. Maybe I'm credulous. Um, so, so anyway, I call this, I, I, I've described what I'm talking about as a negative dialectic, right? So this idea that you take any claim, like I have a mind or something, uh, and which is Buddhists are inter classical Buddhists are interested in, and then you say, actually, there are all these arguments that suggest that I that I that I don't have a mind, so I don't have a mind. But actually, there are all these other arguments that suggest that the that the idea that I don't have a mind is wrong. Ah, so where <laughs> where do I stand? And this is the positive side to it, right? That moment of ah, uh, the idea is that that leads to a kind of spiritual state. And the Buddhists call this various thing Satori, the later Japanese Zen. Maybe, I don't know if it's quite Nirvana, but it's on the, on the way there. And the idea is that you are forced to give up concepts. You're forced to give up 
argument, um, conceptual thought. You're, you, you, you're forced to give up dis discursive thought, and all you have left after that is um, experience, being, whatever you want to call it. So that seems like a very uh, Buddhist thing, but um, there's also some of this in the Greek tradition. In the skeptical tradition, they tend to be more focused on ataraxia, which is a word used earlier in, in the Greek tradition, or, or other strands of the Greek tradition as well. Ataraxia means something like unperturbedness, untroubledness. Um, and then there was this ethical dimension to it. Once you've achieved untroubledness, you could also achieve kraotes, which um, we're told uh, by one source was one of the end goals of the Greek skeptical movement. That, that's what they wanted you to achieve, was this praotes, gentleness. You, you're, you're a soft person because you know that no arguments that you're affected with can really ever sway you because they're all essentially unsatisfactory in the end. Uh, and so, and this, I, I do think if you read the Greek and the Buddhist text side by side, funnily enough, in the Zen Buddhist texts in particular, there's more of a stress on this heroic individual spirituality, I think. It's very directly mental. It's about your state of mind. It's about this spiritual insight. The Greek texts tend to have a bit more, I think, emphasis on this priorities, um, on uh, the ataraxia, that you are living in the world with other people in a way that's unperturbed, and this is an advantage. Of course, obviously, the Buddhists also have an account of how you are meant to integrate the spiritual insight into into ethics, Buddhism, basically. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's not there, but anyway, I got the sense there was that, that slight difference, difference of emphasis. Anyway, so, yeah, the, the, the basic idea in both traditions, as I say, is very similar. Philosophical dialectic is or can be a process that beats down any substantive belief or argument. And if that seems impractical, uh, it, it, it may be, you know, it probably doesn't get you very far in terms of building things in the world. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think either the skeptics or the Buddhists were great sort of um, uh, business people or, or, or whatever. But that wasn't their point. The point is that it, it can stop or quieten your discursive mind and leaves you in this spiritual state of uh, the ability to experience things. And then it is meant to flow into this kind of moral state, moral uh, balance and gentleness or sort of intellectual balance because you always have arguments to undermine whatever claim is being made and and this personal and social gentleness the priorities so yeah I, I find that I find that interesting um, both intellectually and in terms of uh, some kind of spiritual path I mean I still have this big objection around the practicality of it all um, because, of course, you can't live your life disbelieving all claims. At some point, you, you have to make a decision. Although, I suppose, the idea is just somewhere at the back of your mind. You, you, you're aware that uh, you know, you, it might all be wrong. Because you're very used to the idea. Because you've experienced, so, experienced it so much that virtually any claim that's made, virtually any path of action, has counter-arguments against it. Um, so that, that's meant to be the foundation of this, of this gentleness. Um, but anyway, I, it's, I find it interesting and um, maybe even appealing. And I'll, I'll end with just two more quotations that McEvely has in his wonderful book, which again I'll recommend if you're interested in Greek philosophy, Indian philosophy, if you're interested in you know, what we might call the Western tradition, Indian tradition, how they interact, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so the, so the first final quotation is by Sextus Empiricus, obviously in the Greco-Roman tradition. And he says as follows, Skepticism is an ability or mental attitude which opposes appearances and judgments in any way whatsoever, with the result that, owing to the equipollence, so the equal power, of the reasons that are opposed, we are brought firstly to a state of mental suspense, and next to a state of unperturbedness or tranquility. That's the ataraxia. And finally, uh, Santiveda, who's an 8th century uh, Buddhist writer, Indian Buddhist writer, he says this, When neither existence nor non-existence is presented to the mind, then, through lack of any other possibility, that without support becomes tranquil. <laughs>